The last time we were together, we spoke about intermittent fasting, and specifically, we spoke about what it is, how best to maximize some of the benefits that it can bring you, and we worked on debunking several myths that people have regarding this practice. And some of these included how to keep your muscle anabolic when you're eating infrequently, or how to not gain weight when you do eat. But one of the things that we didn't discuss is fat loss. And if you're anything like an average human on this planet, you're walking around with more than a few unnecessary body fat pounds on your body. Now, this is not to say that you shouldn't have body fat on your body because it is healthy and in fact necessary to have that, but the average human is carrying more than necessary. So in today's video, I wanna to talk to you about how to utilize intermittent fasting and little tweaks in your diet into making your body more fat adapted, meaning, making your body utilize its stored fat for fuel rather than the food that you're constantly consuming. So if that piques your interest, just keep on watching. So starting off, I want to give you a very brief and very simplified scientific background on exactly what happens when you eat food. So you consume your meal and it gets taken all the way down your digestive tract and broken up into its component nutrients. Now we did discuss what these component nutrients are in our last video, but as a reminder, they are glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids. So each of these component nutrients, once the body senses a rise in their value in the bloodstream, they trigger the beta cells in your pancreas to secrete a hormone called insulin. Now the purpose of insulin is to regulate blood sugar levels. Each of these component nutrients do cause a rise in insulin, but by far the greatest secretion of insulin is seen with the intake of glucose. So what insulin does is it shuttles glucose from the bloodstream to its target cells. And these target cells include the liver, muscle, and adipose tissue or fat cells. More specifically, what insulin does is it binds to specific insulin receptors on these target cells and this binding process triggers the display of glucose-specific receptors on the same target cells. So once these glucose-specific re receptors are displayed on the surface of the cell, they can now accept the glucose molecules from your bloodstream to bind onto the receptor and be taken into the cell, thereby being shuttled out of the bloodstream and into the target cell. Now, once glucose is in your body, it either gets utilized right away as a quick source of energy, or it gets stored as a long-term source of energy in the form of fat. There is a really interesting study done by the NIH that used fluorescent imaging to look at how fat cells absorb glucose in the presence of insulin. So what the researchers did was they suspended fat cells in a neutral solution, and they looked at how glucose was being absorbed into those cells. And what they saw was that glucose, or specifically the GLUT4 molecule, was present in single form or in clusters outside of the cell, and it was very infrequently and at a very slow pace being absorbed into the cell. And what they did next was add insulin into the neutral solution. And what they saw was amazing. Within three minutes, the rate of absorption of glucose had skyrocketed, quadrupled in fact. And overall, they saw a 60 time greater absorption of glucose into the fat cells when compared to the pre-insulin state. Now we can extrapolate this information to explain the fed versus fasted state phenomenon. So in a fed state, We've just eaten, so our glucose is high, meaning our insulin is high, which means that we are absorbing glucose into our target cells, burning off the excess for energy, or storing the remainder as fat. But in a fasted state, our glucose is low, so our insulin is low. And remember that in the pre-insulin state, those fat cells were completely infrequently absorbing glucose, which means that in our fasted state, our bodies also are are not absorbing glucose and we have to burn off our stored glucose, which is fat, for energy. 
under normal circumstances, human beings are always eating. And so we spend so little time in the fasted state, but we actually have the ability to fat adapt our bodies. Meaning we have the ability to train our bodies into utilizing stored sources of energy, aka fat, for fuel rather than sustaining itself on the very easily available free glucose. But this takes time, it takes discipline, and it takes a few different measures that you can put in place to upregulate your fat burning pathways. And the overarching thing that we need to accomplish in order to make ourselves fat adapted is to make our bodies more insulin sensitive. And this means that we need our bodies to be responsive to the quick bursts of insulin so that not a lot needs to be released in order for our bodies to respond. And that insulin gets easily depleted then and we can shuttle right back into fat burning zone. Now, there's several ways in which we can accomplish this, but the four main ones that I want to talk about are eating a low-carb, high-fat diet, exercise, caloric restriction, and intermittent fasting. So starting off with the low-carb, high-fat diet, it makes sense that if you're not eating a lot of carbs, you're not taking in a lot of glucose, then your body is forced to turn to fat stores for energy. And at the same time, carbohydrates cause, like we said, the highest increase in insulin secretion. So if not a lot of insulin is secreted, then we can quickly shuttle back into our fat burning zone. Our bodies are so lazy. They want the easiest way out of any situation. So say you've just eaten a meal, you have all of this glucose available in your bloodstream. Why on earth then would your body put itself through the trouble of going and freeing up stored fat, converting it backwards into an energy that it can use when it has that easily available glucose right there in the bloodstream. It's not ever going to do that. And high sugar levels are toxic to the body. They are a breeding ground for infection and disease. So your body wants to burn off any free sugar or glucose right away to get its overall state out of that toxicity. So in that situation, then it makes sense that your body's going to be preferentially burning glucose rather than fat. Another similar situation is when you take in alcohol. Alcohol is so toxic to our body also, and our body wants to get rid of it, so it's going to use up all the sugar from the alcohol for energy, and then that way alcohol completely sabotages your fat burning goals. Now, the next thing is exercise, and in this video, I'm not going to go into depth about aerobic versus anaerobic exercise and which burns fat preferentially and which burns carbs preferentially, because I will leave that to its own separate dedicated video, but I will say that high-intensity exercise quickly depletes glycogen and glucose from the bloodstream. And the way that you can implement exercise into your routine to make sure that your body is in its fat adapted state is by having your meals right after you exercise or having your larger carb rich meals right after you exercise. And the reason behind this is when you exercise, your muscles get depleted of their stores of glucose. So when you eat, your muscles are going to be like a magnet drawing in all the free glucose from the bloodstream. And if you want your glucose to go anywhere, you want it to go to the muscles so that it can repair them, you won't feel so much stiffness and soreness the next day, and it'll help with hypertrophy if that's what you're going for. Now, since all your glucose has been shuttled into your muscles, there's so little left to be stored as fat. Makes sense, right? And exercise should be implemented into your routine anyways. 20 minutes a day even of high intensity exercise is so good for not only your heart health, but your overall fitness. And the best part about high intensity training, utilizing your muscles, and of course this goes more in depth into the aerobic or anaerobic training that I will discuss later, but what you need to know right now is high intensity exercise leaves you with the afterburn effect. Now get this. For 24 to 36 hours after you do high intensity training, your body is still burning energy or fat at a higher rate than it did prior to the high intensity training. So you could be sitting around doing nothing and your metabolism will still be revved for a day to a day and a half. 
it's incredible. And this is only with a fraction of the exercise time when compared to low state or steady state cardio or exercise. So now next on our list is caloric restriction. And I am by no means suggesting that you starve yourself or you cut down on calories to a point where your body cannot sustain itself because that's completely unhealthy. What I am suggesting is being aware of the calories that you're eating and not overshooting your maintenance or the calories that you require for your goals and at the same time being thoughtful when it comes to eating if it's not from the earth if it's not freshly grown or roaming the earth then obviously there's a better option for you to eat a lot of the time the the issue with our food is not so much what we put in the foods that we make, but what the food industry puts in the food that we eat. Um, when you're drinking coffee, say, you put a spoon of sugar in, you put two spoons of sugar in, and if you go over that, you tend to be alert to the fact that you're putting a lot of spoons of sugar in, but you will thoughtlessly drink a can of soda or a bottle of soda that has 15 of those spoons of sugar in it that you can't see and so it goes unnoticed and unappreciated and you know before you know it it's not it's not just the coke it's bags of chips it's chocolate it's cake it's anything that comes pre-packaged has added sugar in it for the most part so it's those things that affect our diet and our calorie intake more so than the food that we prepare for ourselves. So my rule of thumb is if you can prepare it yourself, do that. If obviously you go out to eat, you want convenience foods, but don't make that a habit. Make 80% of your diet stuff that you're preparing or is fresh and you you know can live a life of balance that way without concern for how much you're eating or your weight. And finally, my favorite topic, intermittent fasting. Now, our body is like a muscle of any other sort in the sense that as far as fat adaptation is concerned, the more you practice fasting and being fat adapted and fat burning, the easier it becomes for your body to shuttle itself into that zone at any given moment in time. And just like a muscle that's not used, the more time you spend off that practice, your body loses the ability to do that same task that it was once so strong at. So that's why I love practicing intermittent fasting because the more you do it, the better your body gets at it, which means that the more you reap the benefits. So let's talk numbers. Let's really break this down. Your body takes six to 12 hours to digest food. 12 hours is the upper limit of normal, where six is the average. Average meaning for an average aged human of average health having eaten an average amount of food, it takes roughly six hours for the di that digestion process to be completed. 12 is the upper limit of normal, which comes into play if you've eaten a lot, if there's any reason why your digestion is slow. And this can include things like gastroparesis, where the food isn't actually being propelled through the GI tract for digestion, or neuropathy from diabetes, Parkinson's disease, MS, various autoimmune diseases, and even drugs like antidepressants or narcotics. All of these things are reasons why your digestion might be slowed. So if it takes 12 hours for you to enter the fat burning zone, if you're eating the average split, which is 12-12 say, where you're eating for 12 hours and you're fasting for 12 hours, then after you're done fasting for 12 hours, you start eating right away, meaning you've spent zero time in between then in the fat burning zone. So now let's say you're intermittent fasting with a split of 16-8, which is an average intermittent fasting split. So you're fasting for 16 hours and you're eating for eight. 12 hours into your fast, your body enters fat burning zone. And you have four more hours until you eat in which your body is only and only burning fat for fuel. It's targeting those stubborn stores on your body and burning them away. Think about how quickly you will start to see results if you ate this way in a compounded manner every day or every few days. So four hours in a day eating in the 16-8 split is at the very minimum how much fat your body is going to be able to burn.
But say you ate that way six days of the week. You're still giving yourself a whole day off for argument's sake, okay? Six days of the week times four hours a day of fat burning zone means 24 hours of fat burning. That is incredible. Think about how good you will feel and how quickly you'll start to see your body change if you continue to eat that way. You know, and overall, the most amazing thing is while you might get four hours of dedicated fat burning time, which is great for weight management, and of course that was the purpose of this video, you also get just as long, if not longer, where your body gets to purely focus on repairing itself from the inside out. A chance that it rarely gets otherwise because it's so busy digesting and processing food. Your body gets to focus on cellular damage repair, on regenerating stem cells, on starving bad bacteria and boosting brain function and reducing inflammation and fighting infection and the list goes on. The overall wellness factor of intermittent fasting is so far and wide that it's so worth at least trying one time. And I know a big deterrent against intermittent fasting for a lot of people is, you know, they need to sip something before bed or they need to wake up and they have to have coffee. But guess what? You can drink like lemon flavored water or black tea or coffee without milk or sugar or BCAAs or uh, calorie free beverages like sparkling water at any time during your fast without breaking your fast because it's calorie free. So if that was a deterrent for you, I mean, we just put that to bed. You can have your coffee in the morning. You can have your tea before bed. You can sip on your carbonated beverage during the day and you can still maintain your fasted state. So before you try anything, of course, if your healthcare providers are following you for health concerns, then just run it past them. When I create these videos or share this information, I am just sharing the science and the facts behind it. But of course, it's not a one size fits all thing. And I want you to be safe before you try any buddy's advice or any recommended diet or supplement program. Um, when I create these videos, the purpose behind them is to bring you knowledge, understanding, and autonomy over your own health. I am a doctor, but I've also been on the other side of things. And I've been a patient so many times over that I got too much of a glimpse into what patients go through when they come to see their doctor. And there's just a lot of things that I realized I didn't want to do when it came to dealing with my own patients. I don't want you to leave your medical appointments feeling more uncertain and having more questions and feeling worse than when you stepped foot through the door. I want you to walk away knowing what's going on with your health in a manner that makes sense to you and I want you to have autonomy over your health and your diagnoses and your symptoms and how you reach that point and why you're treating it with the methods that are prescribed to you. So my point in making these videos in a long-term way are to act as a medical proxy and advocate for your health so that I can dispel any confusion or myths or fads that are running rampant in today's healthcare and medical world so that you have a better autonomy over your health and you can say that you are in control over your health rather than a healthcare provider because your health should be in your hands. Of course, we go to school and we train for a very, very long time in order to provide you healthcare, but if we are the healthcare providers, the point is you and your health and maximizing that in order to make any decisions because the decisions are not ours, they are yours, you need to be well informed and in order for you to be more informed my idea here is to provide you with as much easy to digest knowledge as possible right now and of course right now i'm just talking about things that interest me and things that i see are uh, misunderstood or not fully grasped in the healthcare and wellness world 
But of course, if there are topics that you want me to discuss or go into depth on um, or things that you would like clarification on or myths that you'd like dispelled, then please let me know. That's why I'm here and I just want to start us off with these little, you know, fad diet topics and things that apply to the world today before we get rolling on the things that matter to you based on the feedback that I receive. So that's it for me in this video. I hope it was a little bit shorter and sweeter than the last few. I know they're super lengthy and I swear I am working on it. Please let me know what else I can work on for you, what you thought about this video, and what else you would like me to talk about. Like and share this video if you enjoyed it, and I will talk to you next time. Bye. Oh, folks talking about back in my day. But homie, this is my day. Class started two hours ago. Oh, am I late? No, I already graduated. And you can live through anything if magic made it.